Hello, greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to this time of worship coming to you from the Sudicum Chapel at the First Lutheran Church of Nashville. Today is the 12th Sunday after Pentecost. This morning we hear Peter's confession of the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter was the right person at the right time with the right vision and the right understanding to make this confession. And the good news is that we are in the same position as Peter in these days. You may be aware that First Lutheran is participating in Project Thrive, a joint effort of Belmont University, the Lilly Foundation, and 18 congregations in the city of Nashville. Over the next several weeks, I am going to be sharing information about the characteristics of thriving congregations as discovered by Project Thrive. These short presentations will be posted on our Facebook page and YouTube channel at the same time as our weekly worship services are posted. So tune in to gain some valuable information about Project Thrive over the next six or eight weeks. I will also be offering a Wednesday evening Bible study on women of the Old Testament beginning this Wednesday at 6 p.m. You can find the Zoom link for our Bible study in our email blasts or by calling the church office. I invite you to turn to the worship pages now from our Friday email message and participate with me in this worship service. We begin with the confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us. And in your spirit, lead us, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, in, in, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus, through whom you have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us now live in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O God, with all your faithful followers of every age, we praise you the rock of our life. Be our strong foundation and form us into the body of your Son that we may gladly minister to all the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And we turn to our lectionary scripture readings for this 12th Sunday after Pentecost. The first reading from Isaiah, the 51st chapter. Just as God had called Abraham and Sarah and given them many descendants, so now God offers comfort to Zion. God's deliverance will come soon and will never end. The scripture. Listen to me, you that pursue righteousness, you that seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, our, your father, and to Sarah, who bore you. For he was but one when I called him, but I blessed him 
and made him many. For the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places and will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the voice of song. Listen to me, my people, and give heed to me, my nation. For a teaching will go out from me, and my justice for a light to the peoples. I will bring near my deliverance swiftly. My salvation has gone out, and my arms will rule the peoples. The coastlands wait for me, and for my arm they hope. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look at the earth beneath. For the heavens will vanish like smoke, the earth will wear out like a garment, and those who live on it will die like gnats. But my salvation will be forever, and my deliverance will never be ended. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading comes from Paul's letter to the Romans, reading from the 12th chapter. In response to God's merciful activity, we are to worship by living holistic, God-pleasing lives. Our values and viewpoints are not molded by the time in which we live, but are transformed by the Spirit's renewing work. God's grace empowers different forms of service among Christians, but all forms of ministry function to build up the body of Christ. The Scripture. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel for this day comes from the Gospel of St. Matthew, reading from the 16th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. At a climactic point in Jesus' ministry, God reveals to Peter that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus responds with the promise of a church that will overcome the very gates of Hades. The Gospel reading. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. 
Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. As we begin our sermon time, let's join in a word of prayer. Gracious God, a few heartfelt words spoken at precisely the right moment can change the course of history both then and now. Thank you for the blessing of this confession and may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. When my children, Christina and Daniel, were growing up, we couldn't get enough of ice hockey movies. If you know me, you probably aren't surprised by that. I can't tell you how many times we watched the Mighty Ducks trilogy, except that we wore out the VHS tapes and then had to buy the DVD versions. But our very favorite movie was called Miracle which tells the story of the 1980 U.S. Olympic hockey team's victory over seemingly invincible Russia. Great moments are born from great opportunity. So says Kurt Russell, playing the part of U.S. Olympic hockey coach Herb Brooks. And that's what you have here tonight, boys, he tells his team, great opportunity. That's what you've earned here tonight. One game. If we played them ten times, they might win nine. But not this game. Not tonight. Tonight we skate with them. Tonight we stay with them. And we shut them down because we can. Tonight we are the greatest hockey team in the world. So the U.S. team goes on to win after hearing one of the greatest speeches ever given. Now, Jesus creates a great opportunity for his disciples in the district of Caesarea Philippi, where King Herod has built a temple to Caesar Augustus. Jesus asks them, Who do people say that I am? The disciples say, Some say John the Baptist but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. So you see, that's the word on the street. Jesus, the Son of Man, is believed to be John, Elijah, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But who do you say that I am, Jesus says, making the question personal. Simon Peter answers, you are the Messiah, the Son of the Living God. A great moment, born from a great opportunity. Peter makes a declaration about Jesus that changes the course of his life and the history of the entire Christian community. It begins with a few heartfelt words spoken at precisely the right moment. A great speech. Well, okay. Maybe it wasn't a speech in the technical sense of the word, more like the greatest comment ever made, the greatest answer ever given. But it was great, maybe the greatest ever. So what makes Peter's statement so powerful? Well, simply put, it was said by the right person at the right moment, with the right vision, and the right understanding. All of this is true for Peter when he makes his declaration about Jesus. And it can be true for us as well at this point in the life of First Lutheran Church of Nashville. Let's unpack this a little bit. For starters, Peter is the right person. Make no mistake, he has the same strengths and weaknesses as the other disciples. He will protest forcefully when Jesus speaks of his suffering and death. 
and will stumble badly when he denies Jesus on the night before the crucifixion. But because Peter, so very human, so much like any one of us, you see, he was the right person to make this declaration about Jesus. Peter also speaks at the right moment. Jesus is nearing the completion of his ministry in Galilee. Soon he will head toward Jerusalem and face the suffering and death that awaits him there. But first, he needs to make sure that his disciples are clear about who he is and what the community of his followers will look like. This time in Caesarea Philippi is the right moment for Peter to speak. And when he makes his statement, Peter also has the right vision. He senses Jesus is no mere prophet. Peter sees that Jesus is the Messiah, the one who has been anointed by God to rule. And literally, that's what Messiah means in Hebrew, anointed, a title usually attached to a king, but more than that, someone who has been set aside, set apart for a special task. Peter considers Jesus to be his king, the one who brings the kingdom of God into the middle of human life. On top of this, Peter has the right understanding. He grasps that Jesus is the son of the living God the one who shows God's divine power and love more clearly than anyone else. In the very next chapter, Peter will hear God's voice boom out of a cloud on the Mount of Transfiguration, confirming the accuracy of this understanding. This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Well, Jesus is impressed. In fact, he says to Peter, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. Jesus sees that Peter's declaration is a pure gift of God, and he's thankful for it. You are Peter, he says, and on this rock I will build my church. Jesus gives him a name which means rock, saying that Peter will be the rock on which the Christian church will be built. The gates of Hades will not prevail against it, predicts Jesus. The church will be so strong that death itself will not be able to overcome it. Jesus concludes by giving Peter the keys of the kingdom of heaven with authority to bind and to loose, which means that Peter now has the authority to be the chief teacher in the church and to share his grace and truth with the world, just as the church continues to do today. So what can you and I do to follow the example of Peter in being the right people in the right moments, sharing the right vision and the right understanding? The coach in the movie Miracle says, great moments are born from great opportunity. And the truth is that each of us has a great opportunity to play the role of Peter in the world today, since we share his strengths and weaknesses and have similar opportunities to declare that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. This is a great moment, and these are exciting times for First Lutheran. We are being stretched. We are learning to be church in a whole new way, to minister effectively in these days of pandemic and isolation. It isn't easy. We are having to learn to do things and in ways that challenge us. But we are the right people to say that Jesus is our Messiah. We are the, the healthcare workers and retired nurses who know that Jesus is the great physician. We are the soldiers and sailors and first responders who honor Jesus 
as the Prince of Peace. The students and teachers who grasp that Jesus is the truth. The business people that see him as King of Kings. And the scientists and researchers who look to him as the bright morning star. We speak at the right moments when a child is struggling and needs a word of encouragement in these days of distance learning, when families are being stretched in so many different ways and need a helping hand, when a demonstration or a conflict erupts and can be diffused by a message of reconciliation, when a colleague is wandering and needs a word of guidance, and when a friend is dying and needs to hear that Jesus has conquered death. The right vision focuses on Jesus as our sovereign, the one who rules our faith and life, the one who guides this congregation through the presence and activity of the Holy Spirit among us. We look up to Jesus as the one who rules over us with perfect grace and love. He is the master we serve with our time, abilities, and money. He is the Lord who gives us direction as we make decisions about our futures, about relationships, careers, and family life. To say that Jesus is Messiah is to say that he is large and in charge. Finally, a right understanding grasps that Jesus is the Son of the living God. We understand him when we stand under him, seeing that he's in close and intimate relationship with a God who is alive and well and active in human life. Because Jesus is God's Son, he puts a human face on the grace and truth of our Creator. When we understand Jesus, we understand God. So Peter was given an opportunity to give a speech about Jesus, and it turned out to be the greatest ever. He didn't miss his moment, and neither will we. In the name of Jesus, amen. And now the peace of God which passes all human understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, amen. Join me in confessing our faith now with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Held together in one body by the Spirit of Christ, let us pray now for the church and the world, responding to each petition with the words, Your steadfast love endures forever. Lord God, bless the church that despite the hardships experienced during this pandemic, Christians around the globe will stand firm on the rock who is Christ. Support pastors, deacons, and congregational committees during this difficult time. Encourage and sustain our bishops, Elizabeth and Kevin. Give wisdom to churches that are considering when and how to resume their communal worship schedule. Unfailing God, hear our prayer. Your steadfast love endures forever. Bless the earth that it may be saved from ecological harm. Restore all lands and seas to the beauty and vigor that you intend. Protect animals whose habitat is endangered. 
We pray for those suffering the effects of destructive summer storms, fires, and scorching heat. Creator God, hear our prayer. Your steadfast love endures forever. Bless the leaders of nations that they govern their people with integrity and tend to the needs of the poor. Guard these United States from violence. Give clear purpose to protesters and to police. Inspire our political parties to conduct the election season with honesty and respect for all. God of justice, hear our prayer. Your steadfast love endures forever. Bless our partnership with the Table Ministry and their community. Give vision and purpose to the work they do. Sustaining God, hear our prayer. Your steadfast love endures forever. Bless students, that whether in class or at home, they be kept safe and able to learn. Uphold faculty and families, and protect all who will be affected by the opening of schools. Form college students to conduct themselves with maturity. Benevolent God, hear our prayer. Your steadfast love endures forever. Bless all who are in need, all who have tested positive for the virus, the sick and the dying. We pray for the unemployed, for medical workers, for those seeking a vaccine, for those who are overwhelmed with anxiety about the future. We pray for those we name here, especially Joan Cullum, Patty Cutter, David DiPersio, Ann House, Sherry Johnson, Sandra Cannon, Ruth Price, Gary Shimmer, Rita Stansel, Herma Swenson, Jean Tulene and family, Emma Jean Williams, and those we name aloud or remember in the silence of our hearts. Compassionate God, hear our prayer. Your steadfast love endures forever. We praise you for the lives of all your faithful people. We mourn the death of those we have loved, especially our brother in Christ, David Tulin. Bring us at the end, we pray, with him into the joy and gladness of life together in him, in you. Eternal God, hear our prayer. Your steadfast love endures forever. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who taught us to pray together boldly, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. And let all God's people say, Amen. Now go in peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.
Grace delights in impossible prayers And takes despair and dances round The morning's child shuts out to the sun I will turn, turn I will turn to you Beyond our proof Before we speak, no place to 